8. The Holy Trinity. A. The Doctrine of the Trinity in History. The doctrine of the Trinity has always bristled with difficulties, and therefore it is no wonder that the Church in its attempt to formulate it was repeatedly tempted to rationalize it, and to give a construction of it which failed to do justice to the scriptural data. 1. The Pre-Reformation Period. The Jews of Jesus' days strongly emphasized the unity of God, and this emphasis was carried over into the Christian Church. The result was that some ruled out the personal distinctions in the Godhead altogether, and that others failed to do full justice to the essential deity of the second and third persons of the Holy Trinity. Tertullian was the first to use the term, Trinity, and to formulate the doctrine, but his formulation was deficient, since it involved an unwarranted subordination of the Son to the Father. Origen went even farther in this direction by teaching explicitly that the Son is subordinate to the Father in respect to essence, and that the Holy Spirit is subordinate even to the Son. He detracted from the essential deity of these two persons in the Godhead, and furnished a stepping stone to the Arians, who denied the deity of the Son and of the Holy Spirit by representing the Son as the first creature of the Father, and the Holy Spirit as the first creature of the Son. Thus the consubstantiality of the Son and the Holy Spirit with the Father was sacrificed, in order to preserve the unity of God, and the three persons of the Godhead were made to differ in rank. The Arians still retained a semblance of the doctrine of three persons in the Godhead, but this was sacrificed entirely by monarchianism, partly in the interest of the unity of God and partly to maintain the deity of the Son. Dynamic monarchianism saw in Jesus, but a man and in the Holy Spirit a divine influence while modalistic monarchianism regarded the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, merely as three modes of manifestation successively assumed by the Godhead. On the other hand there were also some who lost sight of the unity of God to such an extent that they landed in tritheism. Some of the later monophysites, such as John Ascunages and John Philoponus, fell into this error. During the Middle Ages the nominalist, Rosalinus, was accused of the same error. The Church began to formulate its doctrine of the Trinity in the 4th century. The Council of Nicaea declared the Son to be co-essential with the Father, 325 AD, while the Council of Constantinople, 381 AD, asserted the deity of the Holy Spirit, though not with the same precision. As to the interrelation of the three it was officially professed that the Son is generated by the Father, and that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the East the doctrine of the Trinity found its fullest statement in the work of John of Damascus, and in the West, in Augustine's great work De Trinitate. The former still retains an element of subordination, which is entirely eliminated by the latter. 2. The Post-Reformation Period. We have no further development of the doctrine of the Trinity, but only encounter repeatedly some of the earlier erroneous constructions of it after the Reformation. The Arminians, Episcopius, Cursilius, and Limbaugh revived the doctrine of subordination, chiefly again, so it seems, to maintain the unity of the Godhead. They ascribe to the Father a certain preeminence over the other persons, in order, dignity, and power. A somewhat similar position was taken by Samuel Clarke in England and by the Lutheran theologian, Carnes. Others followed the way pointed out by Sibelius by teaching a species of modalism, as, for instance, Emmanuel Swedenborg, who held that the eternal Godman became flesh in the Son, and operated through the Holy Spirit, Hegel, who speaks of the Father as God in himself, of the Son as God objectifying himself, and of the Holy Spirit as God returning unto himself, and Schleiermacher, who regards the three persons simply as three aspects of God, the Father is God as the underlying unity of all things, the Son is God as coming to conscious personality in man, and the Holy Spirit is God as living in the Church. The Socinians of the days of the Reformation moved along Arian lines, but even went beyond Arius, by making Christ merely a man and the Holy Spirit but a power or influence. They were the forerunners of the Unitarians and also of the liberal theologians who speak of Jesus as a divine teacher and identify the Holy Spirit with the immanent God. Finally, there were also some who, since they regarded the statement of the doctrine of an ontological trinity as unintelligible, wanted to stop short of it and rest satisfied with the doctrine of an economic trinity, a trinity as revealed in the work of redemption and in human experience, as Moses Stewart, W. L. Alexander, and W. A. Brown.
For a considerable time interest in the doctrine of the Trinity waned, and theological discussion centered more particularly on the personality of God. Brunner and Barth have again called attention to its importance. The latter places it very much in the foreground, discussing it in connection with the doctrine of revelation, and devotes 220 pages of his dogmatics to it. Materially, he derives the doctrine from scripture, but, formally and logically, he finds that it is involved in the simple sentence, God speaks. He is revealer, father, revelation, son, and revealedness, Holy Spirit. He reveals himself, he is the revelation, and he is also the content of the revelation. God and his revelation are identified. He remains God also in his revelation, absolutely free and sovereign. This view of Bath is not a species of Sabellianism, for he recognizes three persons in the Godhead. Moreover, he does not allow for any subordination. Says he, thus, to the same God who in unimpaired unity is revealer, revelation, and revealedness, is also ascribed in unimpaired variety in himself precisely this threefold mode of being. The Doctrine of the Word of God, page 344.